Um, so we were established in 1986 as part of the Automobile Club in, um, in, in the UK, the AA, um, as a foundation for road safety research. And we became independent from them in 2007 as a standalone UK charity. Um, we were a founding partner of the European Road Assessment Programme and we were key to developing IRAP, and I'll be talking a bit about IRAP later, so hopefully um, that gives you some context of why I'm talking about IRAP. Um, we have a thriving annual programme um, at this very small charity. We do risk mapping, um, and we've done that annually since 2002, and I'll be talking a bit about risk mapping in a, in a moment. Um, we do star rating, IRAP star rating of local and national road authority networks. We work with um, the UK Department for Transport um, on various projects, including um, Safer Roads Fund, which I'll also um, speak about um, shortly. Um, we look at policy, road safety policy. So looking at governance and funding arrangements for local and national road authorities. Um, and we do other little little bits and pieces, so things like um, the Older Drivers Task Force, so looking at how we um, can help um, our older driving population continue to drive safely into old age, um, safe system training, uh, sporting knowledge transfer overseas, and we also do um, some work on uh, preparedness for, um, of roads for autom autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles. We do bits and pieces of research as well, um, looking at urban road safety measures, um, and we're currently doing an evaluation of emergency active travel facilities that the UK government put in place when um, we were in lockdown and people were taking their daily exercise, but there wasn't enough space for people to be able to pass one another um, with enough distance to um, stop the spread of COVID. So um, they put in lots of emergency active travel facilities and we're doing a, a, an evaluation of the road safety impact of those. So um, lots of different things that we do. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier that we um, were a founding partner of EuroRAP and ultimately involved in the establishment of IRAP, the International Road Assessment Programme. And I just wanted to give you a bit of context of the wider group and family that um, we're part of. So IRAP, um, have got a thriving program. Um, they've uh, been working in 101 countries worldwide. They risk mapped 1.5 million kilometres of road and star rated 1.1 million kilometres of road, and importantly, directed 80 billion or so US dollars of um, safer uh, road in, in infrastructure investment. Um, there's also a huge initiative to um, Built capacity and understanding of, of people. So um, there were there are now 8,800 BIDA users. BIDA is the IRAP online tools, um, and 25,000 people have been trained in safer road infrastructure through the IRAP program. So um, whilst the Road Safety Foundation is just a very small charity operating in the UK, we're part of this big family, and and hopefully I'll be able to provide you with a little bit of context and also tell you what IRAP um, India is doing as well at the end of this presentation. So um, my very, very small agenda for today is to talk about two different methodologies for assessing road infrastructure risk. Uh, the first is crash risk mapping and the second is IRAP star rating. And then I'm going to give you some case, case studies from India where um, IRAP India have been very busy indeed. So the two main approaches that I'm going to talk about today um, are about assessing road infrastructure risk. And the first approach on the left hand side of this screen is all about being reactive to the crashes that have happened on a network um, historically. So these are crashes that have been recorded by the police and put into a database that we can analyse and learn about our road network through, uh, through that database. So um, the other methodology is a proactive methodology. So this is trying to um, understand risk across the network before crashes accumulate. So understanding how the different um, layouts of roads and types of roads can lead to different collision records in the future. So this is um, the main difference really. On the left hand side, we've got a reactive approach where we react to what's happened already. And on the right hand side, we've got a proactive approach where we proactively look for risk across the network and treat it before um, people are seriously killed 
uh, seriously injured or killed. Um, so I'm going to go through those two in quite a lot of detail in this presentation because you've given me quite a lot of time um, and um, hopefully they'll, they'll be of interest to you. So in our crash risk mapping works, this is where we're looking at historical crash record, crash record across um, the road network. Um, we mainly um, look at this from a policy perspective. So we're, we're trying to create the policy environment to make sure that investment in roads is made in an appropriate way. So we um, publish this work every year and you can look on the website and find um, lots of reports and examples of this. The latest one um, is the uh, picture on the left, the looking back, moving forward um, uh, publication. In the middle of this slide, you can see a figure that looks at the road safety performance of the United Kingdom against different other um, European countries to show how we're doing and how we've progressed over time. So um, basically over the last um, 20 years or so, uh, what's happened in the UK is that we made great progress um, and then we've reached a plateau where we're just not making the progress that we need to anymore. Um, although our road safety performance is one of the best in the world and you know we're really um, grateful that we're in that position, we need to continue to strive forward to reach an ultimate goal of um, zero road deaths. That's really what we're all after. Um, the picture on the right hand side shows you our very first um, crash risk map um, back at uh, using 1997 to 1999 data. And uh, the, the uh, map on the right that picture shows you um, the latest one using 2016 to 2018 crash data. And um, so it allows us to track performance over time. And you can see that um, in those pictures, you can just about make out that the um, routes have become slightly less high risk. So we're moving from the blacks and reds, which show that they're high to medium to high risk through up to the uh, medium, low to, uh, medium to low risk and low risk routes that are shown in yellow and green. So we have made great progress over those 20 years, but there's still much, much more to do. We, um, we still have about 1800 um, uh, road deaths every year, um, which is going to sound like small fry in comparison to your, your road death toll in, in India, but um, we still can do better and we can still save lives and prevent um, serious injury. So in this analysis, we take all of the A roads and motorways in Great Britain. So that's our um, sort of primary route network. Um, and uh, we use a reactive approach based on crash data. What we can do with this approach is to start to look at the performance of different networks um, over that period and to start to pinpoint where there might be opportunities to save, save lives and serious injuries. Um, so in this table, um, there's the different networks that we analyse um in uh in, in great britain so at the top we've got england um we are the british isles so we have scotland and wales as well they're distinct countries but within the united kingdom um we have strategic roads we have major roads we have strategic roads and major roads combined for england and then local authority a roads so those are the primary local authority roads in Great Britain. Um, we start to look at um, the length of those networks, the um, amount of traffic using those networks, number of fatal crashes, number of fatal and serious crashes on those networks, and um, the fatal and serious crashes per 100 kilometre road length. So that starts to give us an indication of the density of crashes across the network. So taking the number of fatal and serious um, crashes, dividing them by the, the length of the network. Um, and then we have the number of face and serious crashes per billion vehicle kilometers driven on those networks. So this is starting to take into account exposure. Um, so what we can um, what we can see is actually um, our um, our strategic roads are our safest in England. Um, so we have a crash density of 18 uh, per 100 kilometers. We have um, a fatal and serious crashes per billion vehicle kilometers of, of eight. When we start to look at the major roads, which are just the roads just beneath our motorway road network, really, um, so the very high flow dual carriageways and single carriageway roads, um, you've got crash densities that are much higher, but the um, risk per billion vehicle kilometers driven is really, really high. Um, so we start to make a point that um, investment on this network 
is really, really important because you've got both um, a dense, um, you've got a high crash density and you've also got high crash risk for an individual. So this is where we believe our investment should lie in, in England. So, as I said, you can have um, different calculations and maps uh, for different audiences. So, um, individual risk, where we look at the number of fatal and serious crashes per billion vehicle kilometers driven, so where we take into account exposure fully, um, is, a, is a tool that the public really love. They like to be able to look at a map and say, oh, I'm traveling on this um, road quite often. It's near my home. It's the one I use to get to work or, or whatever. Um, and they like to be able to see how their risk changes as they move along the network um, and understand their individual risk, the risk of one road user per kilometer driven at that particular location. Um, that's really interesting to the public and it's interesting to you know, my kids. They understand the map. They've got a map. It's all color coded. They, they understand what, what kind of roads they're, they're looking at. Um, but actually, that can be quite misleading when you're looking at where to tr um, uh, where, where treatment should be applied on roads, because what you need to do there is to look at collective risk. So it's your collective risk to the community that you're interested in as a road authority. And so that's where we look at the number of fatal and serious crashes per kilometre um, of network. So that's the crash density measure. So here, um, this is where we know that there are lots of crashes that are concentrated on, on a length of road. Um, we take that a little bit further in, in, in our work where we look at investment packages and the potential for investment on a particular route. So here we, we try and prioritise um, investment by the potential benefit cost ratio using average cost of treatments on different types of roads and the sort of casualty savings that we expect to um, achieve if we actually invest on those roads. So um, I'm just going to take you through um, a couple of slides that show you in a bit more um, a more visual way what I'm talking about. So these are the um, individual risk um, risk maps that we produce, which are the number of fatal and serious crashes divided by the amount of traffic. So it's risk per billion vehicle kilometres. Um, we use green to show the low risk routes, yellow, um, and then orange is the medium uh, risk routes. Then you've got red, and then uh, the black routes are the highest risk routes on our network. Um, and uh, we produce these tools every year, which again are on our website if you want to have a play with them um, at the Road Safety Foundation. Um, and yeah, you can zoom in and pan around like you would with any other interactive map, and it just gives road authorities a good understanding of how risk is changing across the routes that they manage. And you can zoom in and, and see various uh, different layers in the GIS system. Some of those layers are um, investment uh, routes that we've identified, and some of them are the pers persistently high risk routes that are high individual risk over a, a long period of time, and some of them are um, the most improved routes, so places where you can see a statistical difference in the performance in one period um, to the next, and we consult and find out what's been done on those routes to make them, say, very much improved over time. So um, it's a really nice tool in terms of raising awareness with the public, raising awareness with road authorities about the risk on their routes, and, um, and, and also to celebrate success through those um, most improved routes where um, we can see that there's been something that's been done that's um, actually had a really positive impact and we can start to publicise what sorts of measures people are putting in place. Um, so those are um, those are our tools. What we also publish is a call for investment out of this work. So this, um, this map just shows you where we've been saying um, these routes are your 10% most investable routes on your network, where we think you're going to get your best benefit cost ratios um, in terms of the cost of um, treatment versus the benefit of, um, of, of the savings that you can make. So um, we publish this and we call on government to make investment. So um, we, we don't have a big road building programme here in the UK, really. Um, it tends to be quite piecemeal now because we've got quite an established road network. Um, and the challenge really for us is to make sure that we can improve the safety standard of existing roads that have um, perhaps been around for many, many years and haven't had much attention. 
Um, so this is where we start to say there are investable packages for your road network. So for example, in England on the strategic road network, which is the motorways and um, some dual carriageways and, and just a handful of a roads, but it's the um, it's your equivalent of the national uh, road network, I believe. Um, we've got 885 kilometers of road uh, covering 44 routes where we're saying uh, the road authority should be investing 234 million pounds. Um, we estimate that the benefit of doing that, so the value of prevention, because you can assign um, a, a value for the prevention of a fatality and a serious injury. And we're saying that the um, estimated 20 year value of prevention is 664 million. We think that that would save um, 1,280 face and serious injuries over the 20 year period. And the benefit cost ratio of doing that is 2.8. So for every pound that you spend, um, you should get £2.80 back in um, uh, value to society of preventing those face and serious crashes. And of course, each of the different networks um, has, um, has different um, BCRs um, available depending on the type of network and, um, and how densely the crashes are uh, located on, on that network. So we were very bold um, in total in this year's um, in this year's report, we called for a, a, an investment of £1.2 billion across the um, British uh, road network. Um, so I'm going to go back now to this screen. So we, I've, I've told you all about the um, risk mapping um, and taking a reactive approach to measuring and assessing road infrastructure risk. Um, now I'm going to talk about a proactive approach. and. This is a slightly more innovative um, way of looking at the world. So we're not looking back at crashes that have happened. We're trying to predict where they're going to happen in the future based on um, the actual characteristics of the road and relationships that we know are established in, um, in, in causation and um, severity of crashes. Um, if anybody's got... Um, any questions about risk mapping, crash risk mapping, or um, want to know more detail, um, I can always give you some more detail offline or happy to take any questions as we go. If um, um, I'm having a quick look at the chat as we as we go through. So have any questions, do say. So um, the IRAC star rating model is what we use to proactively assess risk across, um, across our road network. Um, this IRAP star rating model has been developed to provide a simple and objective measure of the safety performance of road infrastructure. And it provides uh, star ratings for vehicle occupants, for motorcyclists, for pedal bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, the model itself um, hasn't just been developed by IRAP alone, but through many, many partners over the last 20 years. Um, so I don't know how many of these you'll be familiar with, um, but there are lots of research institutions, um, Myros in Malaysia, uh, TRL here in, in the UK, ARB Group in Australia, SWAV in, in the Netherlands, um, and uh, there are various um, uh, local programmes as well that input, and road authorities who, um, who make sure that everything in the IRAP model is as good as it can be. So the, the Global Technical Committee are there to make sure that the model um, has the best available evidence, scientific evidence behind it, um, and that it um, is as robust as it needs to be, and also to make sure that when new bits of the model are proposed, that, um, that it stands up to scrutiny and, and review. Um, so, for example, here in the UK, we've developed a shunt model recently for motorways um, to be included in the IRA methodology. Um, and that was taken by TRL to the Global Technical Committee for uh, ratification and uh, scrutiny before it then becomes part of the IRAP model going forward for everybody else. We also have an innovation framework. So um, there's lots of um, innovation themes at the moment for us, um, including making sure that the models are ready for, um, for autonomous vehicles or, or semi-autonomous vehicles along the way. Um, making sure that we can collect data in the most effective way. So um, there are projects on machine learning and 
um, AI and all sorts of things that are going on in the background. So that innovation framework is really important to keep us up to date and fresh and ready for the challenges of the future. So to give you a very, very broad overview of the IRAP process, um, the first thing that happens is that we undertake a survey of a road network and code road attributes from video. Um, we then model risk based on safe system principles. We estimate the number of casualties we expect in the future at every location across the network. We trigger uh, 90 possible engineering countermeasures and then test those countermeasures to generate benefit cost ratios uh, and a treatment programme that should be effective in reducing the number of face and serious injuries. So when we do our videoing, we can do that in lots of different ways now. And we're, we're really lucky because when I first started on um, this kind of work, we had to send out great big bands with three forward facing cameras and one facing the rear and um, you know it was a really expensive exercise to capture sufficient quality um, video data and, and video data that's geo-referenced um, uh, properly so you know whereabouts you are on the network. Um, these days we can use a, a nice light um, uh, Garmin dash cam um, which has got great geo-referencing um, and gives us a nice broad field of view. Um, so the videoing is, is much easier. Um, we can even do um, some coding off of Google Street View and other, um, other things that are available to us, but we, we prefer to go out there and capture our own video if we can. Um, what we then do is um, we enlist the help of an IRAP accredited coding team um, to code the video. And they're about, um, 50 attributes that we code every 100 metres across the road network. So these are anything from um, the width of the lanes, the number of lanes, um, how many pedestrians we see using the road. Um, we record every pedestrian crossing facility and what type of crossing facility. We record every intersection and what kind of intersection, uh, the posted speed limit, um, the distance to roadside obstacles, and the list goes on. And, all of the um, coding process and uh, requirements are very carefully covered in um, the IRAP coding manual. Um, just to give you an idea, these are the sorts of things that we're looking at. So um, we have things, the stuff that's happening in the median, so uh, whether there are centerline rumble strips, whether there's a, um, a, a crash barrier in the median to separate opposing vehicles, um, delineation, how good the lining and signing is on the route, um, how good the crossing facility is, um, pretty much everything that you can think of that you could record from a video about things that have an impact on whether you're likely to have a, um, a, a, a fatal or serious crash is in the model. So it's quite an exercise um, and um, you've got to be quite sort of um, uh, uh, quite insular to be able to do this task well um, because it's quite um, it's quite lonely <laughs> um, I would say um, apparently according to my colleagues um, the best people for doing coding are people that like playing games on their uh, uh, you know um, on a gaming or whatever because it's you know it's quite sort of methodical and logical and it appeals to to people who are gamers basically um what we're trying to do more and more is to move to a point where we can also code from either um, satellite imagery or from video imagery um but i'd say that was early days so far um we've been working with a company in the uk who think they can get 60 to 70 percent of our attributes accurately coded from satellite imagery um, but we haven't proved that yet. So um, at the moment, it's still teams of people pressing buttons as they move along the video. What happens with um, that is that we generate from the coding process, we generate um, a core coding file in a particular format that then is uploaded into, um, into the VEDA software, which is the online IRAP analysis tools. Here we, um, we calculate a uh, star rating. So um, the star rating score is um, a reflection of individual risk for different road users. And you can look at the star rating score for vehicle occupants, for uh, motorcyclists, for pedestrians and for pedal cyclists. Um, and the star rating score 
a bit like the risk mapping um, maps, really, in that it shows you your individual risk um, as you move across the network and how good the quality is of the infrastructure. So a black route is a one star route. That's that's not good. Um, and a green route is a five star um, route. And it's pretty much like hotels. So everyone can understand um, star ratings of, of roads because they're similar to star ratings of other things that they um, they come across. So um, the, the thing that's really nice about this is that um, this is the sort of thing that policymakers and, and sort of senior um, politicians can, can understand just as well as a, an engineer. Um, we have lots of tools within the IRAP analysis um, program that help us to help us to look at risk along the route in a different way than um, than our road safety engineers have been able to before. So, what normally happens here in the UK is that we wait for um, hot spots to accumulate where lots of crashes are happening in the same location, um, and we treat those hotspots and we leave the rest of the road network. So even if there's exactly the same situation further down the road, where there's the same characteristics as the place where the hotspot is developed, we just treat the hotspot. We don't treat the other place where it's the same thing. And, and as people tend to talk about, it's an accident waiting to happen. Um, so we this gives us an opportunity to look at the inherent risk along a route based on the road attributes all the way along the route, not just a hotspot. So um, it's, a, it's a really powerful thing when, um, when, when our research engineers get this kind of information in their hands because they can look at the world in a slightly different way. So this is one of my favourite um, screens in the IRAP analysis tools. It's called the risk worm by crash type. And what you can see here is along the x-axis, we have distance along the route. Um, and in BIDA, the little marker point on the map moves as you move along your, your cursor along the um, along the graph um, and it shows you where you are exactly and each of these um, these columns represents a 100 meter section um, and the different colors in the graph show you your different um, uh, contributions different types of um, crash risk uh, along the route. So this is just for vehicle occupants at the moment. The pink um, shows you where there's intersection risk. The green shows you where there's um, runoff road risk on the passenger side and the grey shows you where there's runoff road risk on the driver side. Um, the yellow shows you where there's head on risk and the blue that you can just see peeking through at the top of some of these bars is um, head on overtaking risk. So. As you move along the route, you can say, OK, there may not have been a crash here already, um, but we can see that there's some um, runoff road risk um, that we might want to treat to prevent any future crashes from happening, uh, happening going forward. Um, we can generate in VEDA very easily um, these graphs for um, pedestrians, for bicyclists and for motorcyclists as well. So showing how each of those road user groups, um, uh, their risk changes as they move along um, by crash type. Um, a couple of tools that we um, that we use here in the UK that we generate from um, some of the files that VEDA calculates, but um, these aren't quite available yet in, in VEDA itself, but will be seen, um, are the um, fatality worm, is what we're calling it, and the speed worm. So in the same way that the um, the risk worm by crash type in the previous slide shows you as you move along the route um, where your different types of risk are. This shows you where the model thinks that there will be fatalities caused by different types of crashes as you move along the route. So on the left hand side, we've got this fatal, fatal and serious injury estimation. And it shows you where the model expects these fatal and serious injuries to occur going forward. And it breaks that down by the same um, crash types is the um, risk worm. And on the right hand side, um, we've got something that we're calling a speed worm. So the blue shows you the um, postage speed limit. So that's the speed limit that's in operation on those particular lengths of route. And the, the grey um, shows you the mean speed of traffic and the orange shows you the um, 85th percentile speed of traffic. So the speed at which most people are observing um, 
uh, on, on, on those, those routes. And again, as you move along the uh, road section, um, uh, you can see how that varies every 100 metres along the way. Now, I get very excited about the speed work, um, largely because um, I'm a psychologist by training, and I think there's an awful lot that we can learn about people's behaviour as they use um, road facilities. Um, and um, where we can see um, discrepancies in the posted speed limit and the actual speed that people are driving, it tells us something about how self-explaining the speed limit is and how intuitive the route is for people to use correctly. Um, so you can see here on the right hand side of this um, speed worm, there's um, actually a section of dual carriageway on this route. Um, signed, signed for 70 miles per hour. You can see that um, the 85th percentile speed is in excess of 70 miles per hour. Um, I think he used most miles per hour in India rather than kilometers, is that right? I think somebody will tell me if, um, if kilometers would mean more to you. Um, but we, uh, we, we operate in miles per hour. Um, and yeah, you can see the 85th percentile speed is in, in excess of 70 miles per hour, which is pretty fast, actually, in particularly for this kind of road. Um, further along the route, um, although the posted speed limit is 60 miles per hour, um, what we can see is people are actually travelling well within um, that speed um, at these locations. Um, I don't know if you can actually see my cursor moving around, I hope you can. Um, and then in the 30 mile per hour section in the middle there, um, you can see we're actually um, traveling quite a, quite a lot below the, the pace of speed limit, which is good because um, there's probably going to be pedestrians and cyclists around these, these locations. So these are, these are useful diagnostic tools for road authorities to understand uh, people's behavior and um, how they are using uh, the, the road infrastructure and how risky that road infrastructure is. So together, I think those pieces of information are really valuable. Now, um, the reason that we can have um, these, uh, these lines of the orange and yet the grey lines varying quite so much every um, 100 meter or meters along this network is because we started to use telematic speed data um, in our projects. So that's where we're using um, information from black boxes in vehicles and from people's mobile phones um, to track um, how fast people are moving along different roads. Um, and this is um, primarily data that's been collected for the insurance industry here in the UK, um, but it's incredibly useful for our road authorities in understanding how people are using their networks. Um, before we started using telematics data, um, we, were, we were doing spot speed surveys um, where we put down rubber tubes to count, um, count traffic and also to see how fast people are moving um, along the road. But that means that we, we didn't have very much granularity when it came to speed data. Um, and the telematic data has certainly been um, incredibly informative in comparison to those spot speed surveys. So hopefully, um, hopefully we'll be able to use those um, in a more widespread manner going forward. So after, um, after VIDA um, and the IRAP model calculates how many um, face and serious injuries we expect to have at a particular location and um, marks out how many of those are attributable to different types of risk. We then start to pass the model through 90 possible countermeasures. And there's a very complex um, logic tree that um, looks at different scenarios and determines what kind of countermeasures might be appropriate at a particular location. Um, and from fundamental research in terms of um, publications that look at the effectiveness of different countermeasures, we can say that uh, a crash barrier, for example, is 80% effective in preventing uh, runoff road crashes. Um, and then the model can trigger that, um, that uh, measure if there's, if there's um, uh, roadside objects that are potentially um, uh, harmful. It will trigger that countermeasure for a crash barrier, it will then say, and how many of those face and serious injuries do we expect this crash barrier to prevent in the future? Um, and it goes through all of the crash economics to test that countermeasure, how expensive the countermeasure is, um, how effective it would be to um, prevent those face and serious injuries, um, and it comes out with um, a countermeasure 
plan um, for every 100 metres along the route. Um, so for every one of those 90 different um, treatments, there are lots and lots of um, uh, triggers that are going on in the model that then generate a safer roads investment. So this is a, an enormously ambitious thing for the model to do. Um, uh, but this is looking at where the model is saying there is risk based on fundamental relationships between road attributes, um, so descriptors of the actual road layout and, um, and phase and serious crash risk. Um, it's looking at where that risk is, how many phase and serious injuries we expect there to be at that location, um, and testing those countermeasures against, um, uh, against those locations and seeing um, how many phase and serious injuries we might expect to save um, at, at each location. And it does that also the combinations of countermeasures. So it gets incredibly complex underneath the bonnet um, that, um, that comes out with this safer roads investment plan, which is incredibly useful for our, our engineers. So uh, for this example, I can't even remember where this one is from. Um, it, um, it's saying that the safer roads investment plan um, is estimated to save 35 uh, lives over the next 20 years, uh, for, sorry, 35 lives and serious injuries over the next um, 20 years. With the present value of the safety benefits, this is the benefit to um, society of £11 million, pounds, an estimated cost of £6 million, pounds, um, and um, the benefit cost ratio would probably be just under two. Um, you can then see for each countermeasure um, where the um, countermeasure should be applied, um, how many patient serious injuries we think will be saved, and, and all those details in a, in a, in a benefit cost ratio. And if you click on these links in VEDA that comes up with a, a map, um, and then it takes you through to a link through to and more information about that, that measure. Under the bonus of all of this, um, there's a countermeasure, countermeasure download file in VEDA, which gives you every 100 metre location, all of the treatments that were triggered as potentials to, um, to prevent face and serious injury at that given location and all the benefit cost ratios associated. Um, there are various overrides in VEDA which say, actually, there's a better countermeasure out there, so scrap that one. Um, we're going to include this one in the Safe Roads Investment Plan, but you can actually interrogate all of it. So all of the thinking that the model did, you can interrogate um, and, and present spatially as well if you need to. Um, and we have the um, toolkit.irap.org, which has um, information about all of the um, all of the countermeasures. It has references to show you um, where the information comes from in terms of the studies that have been done to show the effectiveness of those different countermeasures and so on. So there's plenty of information out there, and, and that um, toolkit.irap.org is available free of charge at the IRAP website, and really encourage you to have a look at that if you're interested in road safety. Um, so what's different about all of this? I think I've, um, I've touched on some of it already, where I've said historically we've used black spot, hot spot um, programs to determine um, investment priorities. Um, that's all very well and good, but um, hot spots are very difficult to um, robustly identify because you've got all kinds of um, statistical um, nuances that you have to be aware of, like um, regression to the mean and so on. And you know, you can very easily have a hotspot that is just a statistical blip. Um, it's not a, a, a real kind of um, problem, but is an artifact of the data. Um, and this kind of takes us away from just taking this reactive approach and just treating individual locations. It takes us more to a route based approach where we're proactively managing risks, just like you would in any other high risk um, uh, discipline like aviation or mining or, or whatever. The other thing that's different is that we're relying very much on safe system thinking here. Um, so safe system is um, relies on two key principles. The first is that humans make errors and that crashes are inevitable. Um, and the second is that humans have limited tolerances to crash forces. That first principle is really important because quite often um, people say to us, but, but all crashes are caused by people, so you need to treat the people, you need to make the people drive safer. Um, and, you know, there's a bit of truth in that. However, 
it's incredibly difficult to make people behave responsibly and drive safer. Um, and I know that when I drive, I sometimes make errors. I think most of us recognize that we do that from time to time. There's something fundamental about the way that the human brain is that means that it's very difficult for us to be whizzing along at 60 or 70 miles per hour and make perfect judgments every single time. So, you know, evolutionary um, wise, we, we just weren't built to move that fast and to have to take into account all of that stuff in our environment at that speed. So really we will make errors it's inevitable we will definitely make errors even the best driver will make errors um even lewis hamilton will make an error um we we know for example that as people age that they find it very difficult to um, process uh, traffic moving in both directions um so um turning right is a particular problem for them um that's not because they're being irresponsible it's just because they're getting older and we can do something about that we can simplify turning movements at intersections for example to make our roads safer for older drivers so you know it's about understanding that people will make errors that it's inevitable that judgment is not perfect that our brains are wide in a way that means that errors are are going to creep in um it also acknowledges that we are unable to always perceive every last detail that we need to, to make a safe and accurate judgment when we're driving. So, for example, um, motorcycling is much um, less prevalent here in the UK than it is in India. So it's a relatively rare thing to see a motorcycle. And we know from, uh, from uh, research that the brain doesn't see what it doesn't expect to see. Um, and we know that, um, that sometimes people do look, but they don't see a motorcycle because they're not expecting to see a motorcycle. We just have filters. We have limited attentional um, spotlights and attentional processing power as, as, as human beings, and we just can't take everything into account. So this point that humans will always make errors and you can't just blame the human in the system um, is really, really important. We have to get to a point where roads and vehicles and speeds work together in a crash to ensure that the outcome of that crash is not serious or fatal. So we're not necessarily in the business of trying to eliminate all crashes. We're trying to eliminate the injury outcomes that are life changing. So the fatal outcomes and the serious outcomes that leave people disabled for the, the, the lives to come. Um, we're talking about taking a proactive risk management approach, just like we would in aviation. We wouldn't, we wouldn't let, we wouldn't let a pilot um, drive tired or drunk, uh, sorry, fly tired or drunk, um, without safeguards in place to make sure that they are um, they're prevented from doing so. And it's a kind of similar thing here. We're trying to be proactive about reducing this when we know that this is a high risk environment and it's about taking it seriously as seriously as we would in mining or aviation. So that's what's different. Um, and the IRAP sort of approach is really built on this philosophy. I'll take you through um, this slide um, and it's some work that was done by a PhD um, in uh, Sweden in 2005, um, where they looked at the um, risk that you would be fatally injured collision, which is on the uh, y-axis, against the speed of the collision. And they plotted out um, these survivability S-shaped curves, which I think are really important to our understanding of um, the safe system. So uh, the first S-shaped curve that you can see here is for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, as you start to get beyond um, 20 kilometers per hour, 30 kilometers per hour, you can start to see that the um, survivability of a pedestrian or a cyclist in a crash goes, um, goes down. So the, the fatality risk goes sharply up um, uh, but, um, at about um, 35 to 40 kilometers per hour. Um, this is why we often talk about survivable speed for a pedestrian collision being about um, 20 miles per hour, so remember some kilometers. 
Um, so about 20 miles per hour is about, about 30 kilometers per hour. Um, anything above that, you know that um, increasing numbers of people will be fatally injured. A similar S-shaped curve um, exists for side collisions. So um, here we've got um, that the interesting point is probably around uh, 55 kilometers per hour. I think is about 30 miles per hour, she says, thinking I should Google it really. Um, uh, but the point at which people start to become more likely to be fatally injured and that shoots up um, at about 55 kilometers per hour. And then similarly for a, um, a frontal impact, so this is where you might have a head-on collision between two vehicles, um, your survivability um, starts to reduce at about 75 kilometers per hour. So the ultimate um, interpretation of this um, by Tingball and Howarth, um, so Klaus Tingball, one of the uh, founding fathers of safe systems and modern road safety thinking, um, is that locations with possible conflicts between cars um, and pedestrians and cyclists, the maximum speed should be 20 miles per hour. Um, at junctions where there's possible car side-to-side -side impact, so um, uh, T junctions and crossroads, the uh, maximum safe speed should be 30 miles per hour. And with roads where there's possible head on collisions, so undivided uh, roads where you can have vehicles moving in opposing directions without anything separating them, um, the, the maximum safe speed would be 45 miles per hour. So turning that research from, um, from Ramberg on its head, you end up with a policy recommendation. It's quite a, quite a stark one, I've got to say. Um, so here in the UK, we allow um, our, well, our, our national speed limit for single carriageway roads is 60 miles per hour, um, where you can have a head-on crash uh, very easily. There's just you know dotted white line between, um, between vehicles, so if someone's only got to just lose concentration for a split second, you've got a head-on crash. Um, Really, what, what um, Tingvall and Howarth are saying is that the maximum speed limit for a single carriageway road should be 45 miles per hour and no more. So it's really um, it's a really interesting way of looking at things and takes us a little bit further out of our comfort zones as road safety engineers and road authorities than perhaps we might like. But if we're serious about achieving zero fatalities, then it's the only way that we would actually achieve that. Um, one off road crashes, um, I've got an extra a couple of slides because these are not as easy um, in terms of um, survivability rules as, um, as head-on crashes and, um, and side impact crashes and pedestrian um, cycle crashes. Um, here, severity is determined by the speed of that you're moving, the distance to the object that you hit and the angle and the type of object. There's all sorts of things going on there. And in the IRAP model, um, we have um, we have risk values assigned to different things that are at the side of the road that reflect this. Um, and um, depending on the type of thing that's at the side of the road depends on how much risk is attributed to the possibility of run off road crash at a particular location. So to give you an idea, um, the most severe crash would be running off the road and falling down a cliff um, because your survivability would be near enough um, zero. Um, but if you look at um, the potential for running off a road and uh, crashing into, let's say, um, a safety barrier, um, your risk is reduced um, uh, re in relative terms from 90 to 12 or 15, depending on which kind of barrier you're going to install. So, um, so the IRAP model has got lots and lots of lots of this underneath the bonnet, which looks at the different types of layouts and the different outcomes that you might um, you might have if you were to have that kind of crash. And for the um, roadside objects, there's also um, a multiplier that deals with the distance from the running edge of the road to the um, to the object as well, um, and various other um, other factors that might prevent a crash from happening, happening in the first place, um, whether there's a paved shoulder to allow for correction if you start to run off the road, 
um, whether there's shoulder rumble slips to warn you that you're running off a road, um, you that rumbly sensation can go over them. So um, it's, it's got tons of stuff built into it, into the runoff um, road risk model. Um, quite often, um, quite often people ask us, what's the relationship between um, these star rating and, um, and, and crash data? And um, the study that I found that looks at this um, was from Australia and um, looked at the ooh, looked at the cost of um, being injured per kilometer travelled against the star rating. And um, as you move up the star ratings, the crash costs approximately halve. So there is a nice strong relationship between uh, higher up star ratings and um, A sip of water. What I'd like to, to do now is to talk a little bit about different ways that we apply the um, IRF approach. Um, the first thing that um, we do um, here in the UK and indeed other people do across the world um, is perform a network wide assessment. So typically these are done every five years um, for strategic roads. So these are your most important roads on your road network. Um, and you don't want to do it every year because it's, you know, it's a reasonably costly exercise to gather that much data. Um, those 50 attributes every 100 metres is you know, a time consuming task. Um, but the benefits of doing that are that you can start to look at your performance over time and your performance in comparison to other, other people. So um, we look at the um, uh, we look at the performance benchmarking according to the star ratings that are achieved. Um, we also look at um, whether we can set key performance indicators for road authorities. So one of the things that we like to do here at the Road Safety Foundation is to, um, is to look at um, performance and to make sure that we are setting stretching targets for our road authorities that are going to start to get us towards and the ultimate goal of, of towards zero road deaths. Um, here in the UK, our, um, our strategic road network operator, Highways England, um, has a key performance indicator um, for 90% of travel to be on three star above roads by 2020, um, which I'm pleased to say they've achieved. Um, and we're just going through the process of helping them to set their next API um, for the next five years. Um, the beauty of doing a network-wide assessment um, is that uh, the data underneath the um, survey can also be used for network-wide modelling of planned investments. So um, at the moment, um, we're working through the Road Investment Strategy 2 for Highways England, um, which will take us to 2025. Um, and it's already been possible to use um, the IRAP uh, star rating system to model the impact of those planned investments. Those those planned investments are mostly for um, for throughput improvements, so improving um, uh, the level of congestion across the network. So there might be things like um, turning single carriageway roads into dual carriageway roads, for example, um, or it might be about increasing the throughput of uh, motorways by including a fourth running lane and, and so on. So we're able to look at the uh, road safety impact of those planned investments um, over the next five years just by um, obtaining information about those schemes and, and modelling them um, against what we already um, have surveyed in the last five year period. Um, we can also use those data to model um, network wide application of countermeasures. So um, earlier I mentioned shoulder rumble strips or raised rib edge line, which is where we have on a motorway, we quite often have um, white markings that have got raised bumpy um, bits of plastic um, set into the markings, which when you go over it, it gives you that rumbly feeling. Um, and I know that um, as you start to potentially drift off, um, if people are fatigued when they're driving, um, going over those rumbly strips can definitely snap them back into um, full control of their vehicle and um, stop them from um, losing control. Equally, it, it helps if people are distracted or maybe playing on their mobile phones or whatever, jolts them back to being in the right lane at the right place rather than continuing to run off the road and crash. 
um, based down the way. So what we did, um, or what Highways England did, sorry, was to look at the impact if they were to install um, shoulder rumble strips, raised with edge line, over every location across their network who doesn't already have it. Um, and that was a really powerful, um, a powerful piece of work, which has um, meant that they can now incorporate putting in raised rib edge line into their maintenance regime going forward. Um, it can also um, be used to outline the potential investment package for the road network as well. Um, so the Safer Roads Investment Plan that's generated um, through the uh, IRAP survey that we spoke about earlier, we have that for the entire strategic road network um, in England, some sort of 5,000 kilometres or so of road. You might also be aware of the um, Sustainable Development Goal. Um, so de Sustainable Development Goal 3.6 is to halve the number of road deaths by 2030 this decade. And that's just been renewed by the United Nations. Um, sitting underneath that Sustainable Development Goal are 12 global road safety targets. And um, targets three and four relate to safety performance of the road infrastructure and can be measured using IRAP. Indeed, the, um, the new roads uh, uh, target three um, is for all new roads to achieve technical standards for all road users to take into account road safety or meet a three star or better um, safety rating. So it allows us to monitor progress towards those targets going forward, which is really important. We also, um, uh, sorry, just um, realised this slide has some repetitive information on it. So um, the investment package modelling that we do, I've already talked about the major road building initiatives that we can model the um, uh, network-wide application um, modelling of one or more countermeasures, like with the shoulder and rumble strip. We also can um, model subsets of countermeasures for inclusion in different road authority activities. So, um, for example, we have within the IRAP um, countermeasures, we have lots of sort of maintenance-y kind of countermeasures, which are things like improving the signing and the lining, um, things that can be done just through paint, effectively, although it's a bit more technical than that, but um, can be achieved through um, relatively low cost countermeasures. Um, and with those basic maintenance kind of measures, we can suggest that they're included in renewals work. Then we have the next sort of step up of um, countermeasures that are more uh, traditional safety scheme measures like um, putting in um, crossing points for pedestrians and so on. And then you have the ambitious um, countermeasure programmes, which would count as major works, things like um, putting in um, a dual carriageway instead of a single carriageway or changing a junction type. Um, so these are the really big expensive things. So what we um, what we do is we can model those um, at different levels of benefit cost ratio cut off in the model, which I think is quite a powerful thing to do to allow a road authority to see where the sweet spot is for their investment. So um, this is just um, this is just a single road um, actually that this, this table applies to. Um, but you can see here that once you get to um, uh, a sort of benefit cost ratio cost off point of um, BCR1, you're potentially saving more people, but it's going to cost you more per person to save. So your um, investment level is um, quite a lot higher at 2.8 million in comparison to 0 0.8 million, for example. So it might just sort of depend on how much you've got to spend. Um, with the basic maintenance kind of measures, um, you're you're talking about um, measures that will save um, lots and lots of people at relatively low cost, basically with very high benefit cost ratios. And we can look through those potential investments to determine um, what would be the most appropriate strategy for investment for a road authority. Um, so we've done. Applying the IRAP approach to a whole network, um, what we can also do is apply IRAP to um, a route or a corridor. So um, this is where we have a look at um, uh, a planned investment route or, um, or a review of a poor performance route. And there are various benefits. It, it means that road authorities get um, safe system inspiration in understanding their risk. 
um, that they can um, develop ambitious treatment programs that go beyond hotspots, which generally just treat intersections. Um, and they can model um, a refined countermeasure program that can be optimised according to their own particular local needs. And we can give them before and after star ratings. Now, we, we applied this approach um, in the UK to 50 routes as part of um, the government's Safer Roads Fund, which was a £100 million investment that was um, committed about three or four years ago now. And those schemes are just about finishing at this point. Um, we estimated that 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 £100 million um, investment would save 1,450 lives and serious injuries with a value of prevention of £550 million and a benefit cost ratio of 4.4. This is the first time we were able to demonstrate that um, road safety remedial schemes on existing roads where you're not rehabilitating the road completely, you're just applying safe um, road safety principles to those roads. Can, that can generate amazing societal returns and amazing investment returns. Um, what we do is we get road authorities to have a look at some of those screens in VEDA where we've got our risk worms by crash type. Um, we get them to review the countermeasure recommendations that are in, um, come out of VEDA. And we get them to develop a locally appropriate and feasible set of countermeasures that meet their own policy objectives and um, their local requirements. And we then can model um, those, um, those countermeasures outside of VEDA. And we get them to do that by just um, simply saying um, at each change point which countermeasures they would want to implement at what location, and we can model that through giving costs, um, benefits, and vacancies, and free savings um, uh, to them, just as we would in the Safer Roads Fund. So it allows us to appraise different investment options ultimately, um, which I think is a really powerful use of the IRAP tool. Um, another application of the IRF approach is star rating for designs, um, and this is to help um, road authorities to meet the World Health Organization rating to target for new roads, which should be three, three star or above, and can be undertaken on all schemes in receipt of funding, giving challenge and stretch to design teams. And this was very much um, a, a very sort of India-centric um, program. Uh, where the Global Road Safety Facility sponsored the first serious application of, of this approach. Um, and um, what, we, what we found was that for an existing road network, the provision for, particularly for pedestrians and cyclists, was really poor. So this is the percentage of the route that achieved three star or above um, initially. Um, and then after the initial design, and then after the final design, where star rating for designs was um, was was had been implemented, so the going through the star rating for designs um, process helps designers move from the second column achievement to the third column. So for vehicle occupants, eighty seven percent became ninety eight percent of the road was um, achieving three star or greater. For motorcyclists, it was fifty two percent became fifty six percent. For pedestrians, 60% became 88%, and for cyclists, 47% became 55%. So it's going to have a real um, strong impact on, on achievement. So um, I'm coming towards the end now, and this is where I've um, been very kindly given some slides by, um, by my India app colleagues. Um, and uh, so forgive me when I don't know these ones quite as well <laughs> as I do my own. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that, um, that there was plenty of stuff happening in India that you can get involved in and um, you can take forward. So I'm just going to have another with a sip of water. So India RAP um, is a locally led um, program of, of IRAP and globally supported. Um, it's a collaboration between IRAP and the Asian Institute for Transport Development. Um, and India Rap is generously supported by FedEx. Um, the first IRAP road safety assessment in India was conducted um, on the um, Delhi to Panipat section of National Highway 1 in 2010. So um, the programme has been going for a good 10 years or so. Um, to date, um, over 23,000 kilometres of 
um, national and state highways have been surveyed, um, which I think is a huge achievement. Um, and that accounts, that network accounts for more than 85,000 deaths and serious injuries every year. The IRAC survey suggests that there's the potential to save over 50% of those deaths um, over the next um, 20 years if the investment is made. Um, some of this work has been um, supported by um, World Bank um, and some of it by um, various other um, organisations, global organisations. Um, and importantly, you can see lots and lots of logos on this slide. Um, you've got Scott Wilson, Vic Road, CDM Smith, um, and, and various other ones. Now, this is really important because um, a lot of the, um, the, the IRAP um, programmes worldwide are a real collaboration effort. Um, there's definitely no way that um, the IRAP can deliver all of this stuff. This is all through partnership working and through a common goal of um, saving uh, lives and serious injuries. And I think 23,000 kilometres is an absolutely amazing achievement. Um, I'm not sure exactly where where you guys are um, are, are set and what what's near you, um, but hopefully you can see some kind of evidence of of IRAP survey um, in your in your patch. Um, India Rap is committed to training and capacity building in India, um, as well as the region, to um, make sure that these um, systemic safety assessments become sustainable um, and. Um, importantly that there is local capacity to deliver the large-scale assessments that are needed to cover your your road network um technical support um has been given to um i think the north is your ministry isn't it and the national highways um authority and um we hope that um, there will be a point where um a star rating target is given um under road safety policy just a few case studies now. Um, so the first one here um, is from State Highway 20, connecting um, it, well, connecting a road in Karnataka. I probably can't pronounce it correctly, so I'm not going to try. Um, but um, a road in Karnataka, um, and it's developed as a safe corridor demonstration project under the World Bank. Um, the project preparation involved star rating of the road before improvement and star rating of the design, which helped to make the design um, safer. Uh, the road construction was completed late in 2016 and you can see in the graph on the top left um, that um, the post-construction assessment shows significant improvement in the percentage of road length achieving three star or better compared to the pre-construction rating. This infrastructure improvement resulted in more than a 50% reduction in the number of deaths and serious injuries occurring each year on that road. That's a huge benefit to um, the communities that this road serves. Um, you can see the star rating um, star rating map at the top there, moving um, the star rating from one and two star up to um, two and three star, which is a huge achievement. Just trying to find the right page with my notes. We've all got mixed up. Okay. Um, this image um, shows. Um, here is a typical forearm intersection on um, State Highway 20. The improvements included a construction of a bus lay-by, a right-turn lane at intersection, and raised pedestrian crossings with um, median refuges, um, which uh, facilitates safer crossing for pedestrians. As a result, the star rating of this intersection improved from one to, oops, one to three star uh, for pedestrian and cyclists to two or three star for most cyclists and two or four star for vehicle occupants. Uh, the satellite imagery here shows um, the pre-construction and post-construction infrastructure of a three-leg intersection on State Highway 20. Um, the treatments included um, traffic calming uh, by yellow painted strips on both sides of the intersection, raised pedestrian crossings, physical median in the intersection area and exclusive right lane, um, right turn, turning lane for vehicles. Traffic calming um, and raised crossing for um, helps to reduce the vehicle speed below 40 kilometers per hour in the intersection area where more vulnerable road users are present. And the set of treatments shown here um, and in the previous image are uniformly applied to seven or eight major intersections on this road. Um, 
This one is State Highway 55 in Gujarat. Um, and you can see here that the um, potential, the, the, the improvement from the initial design to the as-built design was again very significant for vehicle occupants, um, most cyclists, pedestrians and cyclists, you can see on the graph on the left. Um, and overall, the, the road changed from a one-star road to a three-star road for vehicle occupants. Um, this was um, also developed under World Bank support. Um, and in the image here, you can see a four-leg intersection um, before construction. Um, and um, you can see in the bottom a well-designed roundabout um, here. Um, and the improvements um, were from a one-star to a three-star um, road. Um, this is another um, uh, another project in uh, Gujarat um, where uh, race crossing and footpath um, were installed in, in a village area. Um, these kind of treatments um, uh, have helped improve safety for vulnerable road users. Oh, these slides keep changing. I think there might be an auto question on them, sorry. Um, so yeah, you can see that um, these have improved uh, performance. Um, this other example is from Mumbai, um, an urban road, which is nice to see. Um, in Mumbai, about 200 kilometers of roads were star rated. One of the roads um, uh, where there's been a lot of focus um, is LBS Marg. Marg. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce this, but it's a 10 kilometer uh, major arterial road in the eastern suburbs. Um, around 13 people were being killed on this road each year, um, mostly pedestrians, motorcyclists, or those in auto rickshaws. Um, and uh, various um, suggestions were made to improve this road. Um, the final design included sidewalks with uniform width, parking spaces, bus stops, safer intersections, pedestrian crossing facilities, and traffic calming measures. Um, and um, it's estimated that these designs will save more than 70 deaths and serious injuries every year, which would be a 50% reduction. Um, this is quite an interesting one because this is um, an overview of all of the roads surveyed um, in, um, in, in, in India. Well, not all of them, based on 17,600 kilometres of roads surveyed in India. Um, and it gives you a picture of what the roads are like and where some of the shortcoming is. Um, it says for pedestrians, 83 percent of travel happens on one to two star roads. Um, in these pie charts, you can see the black and red color represents the percentage uh, of travel on high risk roads. 95% um, of those roads um, where pedestrians are present and traffic flows at 40 kilometers an hour or more have no formal footpaths or sidewalks. So looking back to those graphs I presented earlier about survivability of pedestrians in, um, in crashes at different speeds, this is a really important statistic for you. For, for these Indian um, national and state highways, 90% um, of those roads were moving at speeds where if a pedestrian is struck, um, you have a very limited chance of survival and there aren't any sidewalks or footpaths for those pedestrians to um, seek refuge from that traffic. 94% um, of roads where pedestrians um, cross and there are speeds um, greater than 40 kilometers per hour have no pedestrian crossing facilities. So it kind of paints a picture for pedestrians that there's much to do to improve um, safety performance of, of roads. Similarly, for motorcyclists, um, we have a, a huge um, amount of motorcycling in, in India. 70% um, of travel is only on one or two star roads, motorcyclists um, and um, there's very limited facilities for motorcycling or pedal cycling. Um, and then for vehicle occupants, 56% um, of travel is on one or two star roads for vehicles. 55% um, of the roads um, carry traffic at 80 kilometers an hour or more are undivided. So there's an opportunity for head on crashes, which again, we know um, that as, uh, as you move beyond about 55 um, uh, kilometers per hour, your risk of being involved in um, a fatal head on crash um, is very, very um, steep, steeply goes up. 
and nearly 90% of curves where um, traffic flows at 80 kilometers an hour or more um, have hazardous roadsides. So things on the um, on the um, on the bend that could actually be very um, serious if a vehicle strikes. And again, 87% um, of intersections where traffic flows at 60 kilometers an hour or more have no safe turning provision. So um, there's a real opportunity here to improve the safety standard of roads for vehicle occupants um, for um, motorcyclists, for pedestrians and cyclists. And I think um, I've reached the end of that marathon of a presentation. I'm sorry it was probably quite monotonous for you all, but I hope there are some questions out there. Um, and I'm also going to leave up um, my colleague Jigesh's details. Um, if you have any questions about the work that's been done in India, um, don't hesitate to be in touch with him. I'm sure he'll be really pleased to hear from you. So, um, yeah, I'd like to open up so if that's okay for questions. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I guess yes, we can look for the questions if there are any questions. Is there anyone out there? <laughs> Really happy to get questions typed in through the chat function if anybody has any questions. Mm -hmm. I guess we can wait for a couple of minutes. If there are no questions, then we can conclude with the presentation, with the session itself. Okay. Oh, no questions at all. I hope I didn't put everyone to sleep. I know it's the evening for you guys. Mm. Yeah, so I... Include the session then if there are no questions and your legacy or shared your contact as well. So maybe if yeah, you want to get in um, touch with you later on. Yeah, sure. That's my email address. So susie.charman at roadsafetyfoundation.org. Um I'd be really pleased to hear from you. Mm, yes, yeah, sure. So I guess we can end the session. So once again, thank you very much for your time and efforts. Uh, for this presentation and explaining a lot of uh, not only you can say about the reactive approach but also the proactive approach which must be followed so yeah, thanks a lot and we are hopeful of having much more sessions in the future itself yeah let's let us know if you'd like um, more on india app i'm sure my colleagues would be very happy to, to share yes sure we will let you know accordingly if there are okay. any possibilities of having a session from the colleagues at India, because that's somewhat a local problem which we are facing. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, take care. Cheerio. Have a nice evening, everyone. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.